Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 21st of May 2014 and um, as usual we're catching up to Karen Fastenpower and others. Um, at any rate, it's been a bug for me more recently than others. Um, having this notion of um, make banks, assignment banks, galleries, um, and um, we've been tracking Alan Levine um, Am I saying your name correctly, Alan? Yeah, that works. Okay, okay good. Alan, uh, for a few weeks now, and he, he finally could make it here. You'll, um, and so we're going to use DS106 and your assignment bank. I, I said in our notes to this as kind of a case study to kind of figure out how that all happened. Um, and I think there's talk of CL MOOC um, doing some work with that. And, and Chad Sansing is with us. And Chad... I think you have 28 pages of um, of makes on um, <laughs> on Mozilla, right? So I thought that was another repository of stuff. <laughs> I haven't counted yet, but yes, <laughs> that, that's feasible. <laughs> right. And Chris Lone and I uh, play around with uh, play around with Ike. Uh, and we'll, we'll we'll get into this a little bit. On Youth Voices, we have a page called Missions where we try to think about um, moving our own assignments for kids out to a larger population, um, you know, perhaps, and we, so we can talk about that. So those are, and, and DIY.org comes to mind, um, and Terry Elliott, um, Terry Elliott, um, yeah, that's right, sorry, um, did, did a really nice job of collecting uh, quite a few other examples. So. Rather than getting into all the examples, um, could somebody else uh, say what we're going to be talking about here tonight? <laughs> With that introduction, introduce yourself first, and then what's your thoughts about all make banks? Where do they come from? What are they useful for? What are the, some of their issues? How do they fit MOOCs? Those are some of the questions that um, I've been asking. Who wants to, Alan, why don't you jump in, introduce yourself, tell us about DS106 and how that assignment thing grew. Sure, Paul, it, uh, I'm Alan Levine. Uh, I don't know what to say about myself because I'm kind of independent right now. I, I've been telling people I'm from the Internet and they seem to like that. Um, but I've, I've been involved with the open digital storytelling uh, class, DS106. Uh, for a while, and the, the original uh, assignment bank, I mean, a lot of what we've done is, is rather um, organically to serve the purpose of that open course, which means often ad hoc and get it running sort of thing. Uh, all our stuff is powered in WordPress. Um, so the first time that Jim Groom taught the course, it wasn't open. It was a course he taught at University of Mary Washington, but a key component is that students um, operated their own WordPress sites and all their work syndicated into a single blog. Some people call that the mother blog approach. And um, when uh, the idea came to do it openly, um, there was a, a famous, well not famous, infamous Skype call. Um, I was there, Martha Burtis from Mary Washington and, and a guy named Tom Woodward. And we were brainstorming ideas about how he would, you know, leverage the open participants in this class and and Tom made a remark to Jim because Jim had designed the class and he says you've got these ten assignments that you have everybody do but he said and Tom is joking he says I don't think that they're all that good um, so what if there was a way for people who were participating in the course um, to submit an idea for an audio assignment or for a design assignment into this bank and then that way people could choose the things they want to do uh, for a unit. And, and that was the genesis, and, and Martha Burtis built the first one kind of on a... Um, there was a lot of uh, duct tape in there, um, a combination of uh, gravity forms to submit. Um, I, think it, I, th I think it actually went to... The first one was a Google form, went to a spreadsheet, and had something um, to come in. And it's been refined over the years. So what we have now is at... Um, assignments.ds106.us and there's probably 600 some uh, things in there um, so the, the affordance that we wanted was this thing where when I'm teaching audio um, there may be one assignment I ask all my students to do I usually do one called the sound effect story um, but we wanted them people to say 
Um, okay, there's this collection of maybe a hundred different audio assignments, and they all have different ratings of difficulty um, that users of the site generated. And so I can say um, the rest of your work for this week is to do 15 stars worth of audio assignments. And then they get to pick and choose the ones they want. If they don't like any of them, they can create a new one. And so when I'm teaching a formal class, um, I always had a requirement that my students had to create two new assignments to add to the bank every semester. So um, it, it's grown by that way. Um, sometimes they're not very good, <laughs> you know, people submit. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, I do some editorial thing, and sometimes I pull one over and turn it into a daily create if it's kind of simple. Um, but, you know, there, there's some overlap and, and duplication. Um, but the the one key feature, again, is that students can create the assignments. The other is because of this syndication model where um, students are publishing their work in their own blogs, it's going to the DS106 site. So if you do assignment, you know, you know, audio assignment, sound effects story, there's a certain tag um, that you're supposed to put into your post. And what that means is when we syndicate into DS106, we can actually add that to that assignment as an example uh, on the, the assignment page. So it's the idea, as people do the assignments, when you go there, you'll be able to see examples that other people have done, and also we have another tag so people can put a tutorial. So if I want to write a tutorial on how I did that assignment, that would go in there well. Cool. So you've hit some themes there already that I wanted to make sure we hit. Um, one of them is, um, and others should comment after I do this, but one of them is that it's work that was created in the context of a course going on or something else happening, but but they exist by themselves, um, or they can, right? So yeah. I think that can be tricky, and I want to kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, but also the quality issue, I think, you know, you say it in a joking way, but I think it's an important question um, because, I, you know, I, telling a teacher to go surf through 600 or even 15 assignments who might not have, I don't know, the, the purpose and, and, and so forth in mind when they do that, I think is tricky. Um, and I think we yeah. could end up with things that aren't so, I don't know, connected to our principles sometimes. Sure. I mean, there's different ways you can go about it. I mean, you could have a group of people who, um, you know, act as curators to help, you know, cull mm -hmm. some of those. Um, they could, you know, the way we set up the site, when someone submits an assignment, they're automatically uh, published. Um, the the new version I'm building has the ability, maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want them to call, uh, all come in as draft, and then you can moderate them. Um, so that's an option. The other thing that we did is that create different ways to sort them. Um, so you can sort them by the newest ones, by the ones that the most people have done, um, by the title. And so finding some different ways to help people, you know, go in there and pick out. I even have a random button, you know. Sometimes a random uh, click is, is the way to go. Um, so, you know, you may not, I mean, I, I'll say, you know, having 100 audio assignments is a bit overbearing. So um, I, I've gone in, uh, you know, over the years and um, you looked at them and sort of I have a way of categorizing what I call the featured ones. So there's a, um, a selected set. And, you know, when I do my audio uh, lesson, when I write up my, my uh, activity for that week, um, I'll usually list like, you know, these are really good ones worth doing on my lesson page and sometimes people want that and then sometimes they look at those and they say I don't like those and then they have the freedom to go in there and, and go beyond um, so you know there's different ways you could do it and with you know with the you know projects that you guys run you've got enough people that could sort of help um, do, do the moderating of that you know you could you know do some sort of thumbs up thumb down you know sorting um, to help that out you know I I think having too many things is kind of a good problem you want to have hmm. I, uh, <clears throat> I'll, right, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in both as like a uh, teacher, but also as the very proud uh, camper of the week for week two um, <laughs> at Mason Mountain for a summer <laughs> dance 106 course. Uh, you know, one great way to like figure out which activities you want to use is just to go through uh, one of the DS 106 cohorts online, or to arrange one with friends, uh, or to approach 
that process of curation as participants. And of course, you invent for yourself by clicking on the random button or doing the daily creates. Um, I shared a link in the comments. Uh, essentially, all the project-based learning work my kids did uh, last year, I was at the um, charter school. Uh, that was all drawn right from DS106 and many of the activities that I did. Um, and thinking about how then to just kind of frame them and support kids who maybe weren't ready just to dive in, how to support kids who were ready to dive in, how to move it towards some kind of coded portfolio later on. Like, you can work it into whatever frame you have, but whether you're doing DS106 or something like CL MOOC or Teach the Web with, with Mozilla, um, I was talking about this a little bit Monday, like the big takeaway is just like feeling what it's like to do it. And that gives you a really good idea of what inspires you, and then you can bring that inspiration back to your classroom, try some things out, and let people get used to the space the same way kind of you did, safely and in a, in a playful way. Mm -hmm. Others jump in here. Um, I was hoping yeah, Chad would talk a little more, maybe you know in a little bit, but your site, class, classroots.org. Uh-huh. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you're a teacher, right? And you teach. <laughs> you Some say so. If you look at classrooms, <laughs> like, yeah, that's pretty ambitious and, you know, like a really great resource. Um, but that springs out of your teaching, right? Yeah, that, that's essentially from teaching and other um, mentoring experiences here, there, and everywhere with the writing project, Mozilla, things like that. So the, uh, the particular post I shared was just uh, topical because it was very much it was. I wanted to, I didn't want to like prove, I didn't have anything necessarily to prove, I just thought it would be great to have the kids do some of the things that I really, really enjoyed doing this summer that I did DS106. Um, it's just such a great community of practice and I felt like I learned and pushed myself through a couple of the activities and it was just, it was the right mix of um, engagement and challenge and creativity and that's, that's great. I mean that's one of the things I love about DS106 and the communities that are like it, that in which I participate. I, I mean, we built it to serve our needs, and now, you know, this is a great conversation to figure out, does that work for, for other instances? And, you know, there are going to be things that come up and are already in working with, you know, Karen on trying to build a new prototype. You know, there are things that, that weren't in the original configuration, or just because I've been so close to it long, well, of course, that makes sense. The way we did it doesn't make sense, so... Um, you know, we're going to try to re-engineer um, uh, some of that. But it, it's interesting to find out the different uh, ideas and, and wishes and dreams that people have uh, for such a thing. You know, so in DS106, it was wide open. So, um, you know, I used a little bit of discretion when I saw assignments come in. I can say I saw maybe three that were sort of like spamish. Um, and it's kind of crazy. We, we let ours go automatically publish to the site, which is probably not what most people um, would do. Um, but um, it, it was more of a problem of just some of them, like, barely being described or, you know, not providing enough uh, context to help someone figure out what to do. So, you know, as, as a single, like, manager of it, I, I sometimes took a moderate amount of liberty with, with editing what, what other people uh, submitted. And sometimes just... Um, you know, unpublishing them because um, they, they weren't really strong assignments, in my opinion. The flip side is there's a lot of times my first impression that, you know, looking at things, you know, like uh, the first time I saw Twitter, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing anybody suggested. And you can be wrong about these things. A lot of, you know, when I do my storytelling workshop, you know, Blabberize was, to me, the stupidest thing I've ever saw. And then someone else looked at it differently and found a different avenue that I didn't anticipate. Um, so sometimes I, I, you know, you can go too far in trying to figure out is this really worthy or quality. Um, you know, you can, you can make some first cuts like if it's just poorly written. Um, but, you know, other people will look at a particular assignment and see something in it that, that you didn't see. Christina, there are others. Who wants to jump in? Terry, what do you what what have you been thinking? Well, um, been thinking about how this works for CL MOOC and 
how how jammed we are going to be to get this working. Um, but I've also been thinking in terms of um, I I have a um, a blog that I run for our English majors in our in our uh, English department, and um, I finally convinced my uh, uh, department head, new department head, that uh, it would be a really good idea if I could have a, a kind of a, a collaborative internship where I have a bunch of interns. And uh, we did that this spring. It had mixed results, but uh, one of the things it convinced me of was um, how little community there is in our particular department. You know, we've got people who are uh, who are in English for teaching. Uh, we have people who are in English for professional writing. We have creative writers, a burgeoning creative writing department. You know, so we've got like five or six different subgroups within our major, and none of them talk to each other. And that was the biggest discovery I made. It was kind of disheartening in a way. But then I thought in terms of that maybe something DS-106-like might be a way to bring people in together through play uh, to develop a sense of community. And uh, so I'm going to work this summer to try to do that and to see if we can get folks to, in our department, majors in our department to play <laughs> using DS-106 uh, uh, assignment bank thing. That's, that's the plan anyway. Yeah, so can some, like, DS-106 is not a MOOC, right? <laughs> well, it depends how you want to qualify a MOOC. It's not... <laughs> I, I, for, for a while, I had on the website, it's not a silly MOOC, and, and uh, it was kind of funny for a while, but some someone thought it was a little so, over the top. So, I mean, without necessarily comparing it to MOOC, I, I've, been, I've been kind of feeling like, for somebody who might not kind of understand... What do you think the principles of DS-106 are? Is that possible to... Sure. I mean, a piece of it is that you publish... I mean, the, uh, the pillar is that um, everybody publishes their work in their own site that they manage. So, you know, uh, as a course for undergraduates, a piece of it is helping people understand how to manage... We actually make students get their own domains. Um, as an open participant, you just need a blog with a, an RSS feed. Um, but again, it's the idea that you're not working in someone else's box, you're working in your own, and stuff is connected through the central site. Um, the other part is that um, I think in a MOOC, to me, the idea is that everybody does the same thing. You know, you start here, and everybody, if you're going to get to the end, you have to march along, you know, kind of like um, all the rowers on um, Ben-Hur inside the boat, and everybody rows together. Um, in DS-106, as an open participant, your experience doesn't really mirror. People pick and choose. You know, some people just want to do the audio, I mean, or just do the visual and design stuff. Some people are there for the audio. A lot of people just do the daily creates. Um, so it, it's, it's relatively rare that someone does a full start to end, and typically they might follow an ongoing class. Um, so what's different is... We might have a class going on at University of Mary Washington, but we set up the site so uh, teachers who are running other classes that might be similar but not exactly the same, something to do with you know, digital media and creative expression. So we've had English courses, uh, cyber history course. So someone might be running a completely different course, but they use the same infrastructure. Their students connect their, their blogs to DS-106. We can generate... Um, a listing of just the people in, say, Paul's you know, class somewhere else. And so it's more of a series of overlapping course experiences. And then, um, you know, there have been at times anywhere from, you know, maybe three to six different ones going on. You know, recently, you know, I, I taught one for George Mason University this spring. Um, so, and what I did um, last fall is uh, no one at Mary Washington was lined up to teach. I needed a break and uh, no one else wanted to teach it so I decided we have all this material from running it over the last two and a half years and I said what if we just republish all the weekly posts as assignments 
and we have an open class, and it's just the people who want to do it. And someone said, and I said, there's nobody in charge because I'm not going to teach it. I'm basically just going to set up the lessons to go, and whatever people do, they can want to do. And um, I, I kept calling it like the teacherless class, and someone came up with the idea it was headless. Um, so there's this whole kind of decapitation theme. Um, um, and and then there, you know, there's a bunch of people who did most of it, and so all that content I kind of rolled into. Um, there's a thing called um, I'll, I'll get the URL in the chat. It's it's the open course. So basically, it's the whole syllabus, the content, um, and all the materials, kind of a, a grand accumulation from uh, mostly the last times I taught it, but it really builds upon the stuff when Martha Burtis taught it and Jim taught it. Um, so it's there as, as all, you know, a full course. And if you want to go through it by yourself and pick your own time frame, um, you could do that. You know, not many people do it. I think the real magic of it is when other people are doing the stuff at the same time. And, and, and for me, um, it kind of matches, you know, I'm not an artist, but, you know, I've talked to people, I know people who work in studios, and there's something about that, effect of having someone in proximity. You're not necessarily talking to them, but someone just, you know, four feet away who's painting and you're painting and you're not talking to each other, but there's people kind of co-creating in the same space. And so it's not exactly the same, but I think in DS106 when people are um, generating their work and sharing it, you know, largely through Twitter, but there's also a Google Plus gang, um, there's something about doing it in the proximity or virtual proximity of other people. Um, you know, right now there's there's a group forming. I don't know what they're going to do. They're they're generating some summer thing based upon uh, you know, someone set up a WordPress blog and it's about DS106 moving into a trailer park. I don't know what they're doing. These people are just setting up their own sort of open experience. And if there's enough people who want to do that, you know, that shoots off in a completely different direction of its own, which probably has no relevance to to what you guys are interested in. I think there's a lot of relevance. Go ahead, Christine. Yeah. Well, I, I just was thinking about, um, it's just exciting to hear you talk about it, Alan, and um, I think what, um, you know, in the MOOC, I mean, it was really Terry who put the bug in my ear, like, you know, if we're going to do an open online thing, we should have a mink bank. <laughs> and, um, and then Terry and Karen got on the task last year, and you know, the, the MOOC itself has a, and anybody can correct me and push back, so I don't feel like I, you know, am representing the MOOC, but I, you know, we have this, this sort of calendar of make cycles, so it is an open thing, and we think about it as, you know, entrances and, um, and exits as much as people want, and, you know, you don't have to follow the whole thing, but, um, and so that's great. But then the infrastructure piece is what was really interesting to me, Alan, when you were talking. Like that infrastructure of this bank where there's a repository where people can go back to. And so what we've been seeing is are people going back to it or using it actively in another context. Or, you know, it's like it starts to connect to all these other pieces that we didn't put in place. Just because it's there and it's stable and it's, you know, it's kind of this um, infrastructure that people can go back to. So I've just been thinking about like what are the infrastructures that we're putting in place? Which of them do we are we there working on actively and which ones do we leave and sort of take on a life of their own and I don't know. I just think it's really fascinating actually um, how these structures get built. And there's the thing that happens like you know actually I don't know how people are using it. You know and I was just at a uh, K-12 conference up in Manitoba and, you know, someone was telling me about they've been using one assignment um, over and over again and, and modifying it internally and I don't really know it. It's not like, yeah. you know, theoretically, there, there are ways to log it but a lot of times when you create these resources, you know, people don't necessarily, you know, leave a little, you know, note for you to say, this is how I'm using it. So but I, that would be cool if they did. <laughs> if they did. And when they do, it's great but I think generally... Um, and I, I'm a, a total optimist that I think there is a lot more, you know, use. And so, you know, I, I know a lot, you know, I, I've seen, I did a, a version of the four icon story thing. I did it with second graders, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and people can take, you know, the whole thing is like, are you looking for something that you can just like 
yes, that's it. I can use this. Boom, I'm done. Or does it, a lot of people, and this is the way I'm pretty sure teachers work, you see something and you say, I like that, but I'm just going to do this to it. And, and um, I think it's important to have it there too and, and know that people are going to take it and, and use it in a different way than possibly you imagine. And that way it connects to WebMaker to me, um, Chad, and sort of the way that the remixes happen, do you think? Chad, you're, you're on mute. You're, oh, you, for a reason, evidently. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on mute and my machine's a little bit slow. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, the remix bit of, of WebMaker makes it easy to kind of adapt things for your audience. Um, and then I'll just say it because I was in the middle of typing a comment in the chat. When I use the, the DS106 prompts in the classroom, you know, I did, it would be not true to say that I wasn't like, setting up conditions in, in which it would be really, really great if we all worked on these together, kids. But it was a class uh, and a school that didn't have the usual kind of coercive mechanisms of, of, of grading or punitive responses necessarily to, uh, to not working on something. There was a lot of negotiation going on. So for me, also, part of it was like consciously trying to not schoolify what was in DS-106 and use it kind of in the same way that I thought you know, I mean, I recognize the, I can't escape my own you know, biases and, and memories and all that, but to, to put it forth in the same way that I kind of found it in the summer. And I think there's value in that, too, in pushing what you do in a, in a classroom and traditional and formal learning spaces. But back to WebMaker, yeah, the, anytime you can remix, and I think there the, the Thimble tool and Popcorn tool in particular make that remixing really explicit, and it's kind of like an invitation to do it. But with maker culture and remix in general, I think there's a good push right now uh, that I wish education would capitalize on more to open up the things that have hitherto been closed or to invent, adapt, remake things that have been uh, not yet remade. So uh, can I throw in uh, KQED's uh, do now and you know the learning blog which I put in my brainstorm list because those sites have you know daily makes too aren't they I mean they're responding to contemporary issues is it is it worth distinguishing between that kind of assignment online and and these banks Is everyone aware of what I'm talking about? <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. right. Yeah, you're like so, uh, so, KQED's daily format and also the do, the do Now. Right, uh, but you, and you can go to the Do Nows and there's yeah. a whole list of them and you could right. you work through those and, and make choices and do it in a non schooly way and, you know, or, or do it daily. Um, so it just seems to me that, that those are kind of, um, and, and the, I mean, where where I often point kids to on the learn the New York Times learning blog is um, am I saying that I think I am? Yeah, it, it's a place where they can learn. Learning they can, network blog. There's a there's a student opinion piece that's put up every day. Um, so uh, I mean, yeah. To me, it sounds like um, you know they're more carefully curated um, for one thing. Um, so my kids, I think there are seems like maybe narrower parameters on the making so you know the the terrain is kind of staked out like in the do now this week I think it was about Nigeria and you know is the campaign um, making a difference or is it effective that kind of thing whereas it seems like uh, DS 106 is kind of like whatever I um, some good stuff I have going I want to share that with people right mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the end products might be kind of similar, but it's how you get there that strikes me as, um, you know, like the DS-106 from what I gather. I'm, now, <laughs> I'm just looking through it as we're talking. Um, seems, you know, it's a lot more open, that's for sure. Well, I was wondering about the distinct, Chris, you mentioned this in the chat as far as I've been following earlier, but this idea of the students being able to make their own assignments is kind of a flip in terms of, it's just one distinction that I see there, you know. 
as opposed to like curated ones, which doesn't mean they're less or more, they're just different in that way. Mm. Here's, a little, here's a little story from where the first year it was open. Um, someone submitted an assignment, um, and Jim was teaching the course at the time. When he saw it, he thought it was ridiculous. Like, who would ever do it? And it was called Playlist Poetry, and it's like, make a playlist in your media player where the song titers, song titles tell a story. And it took off. Like, 50 people did it. And, and for the student, an undergrad student, to see these people who weren't in her class, you know, creating something that was her idea... Um, you know, it's it's it takes that kind of effect when a student gets a comment on their blog and just amplifies it. Um, so again, it was the unanticipated. Like it, it looked like you know, on the surface, an assignment that wouldn't be that interesting, and for whatever reason, a lot of people in the moment uh, clicked with it and said, you know, how how many different ways can can I do this? And then there are variations that you know, people. A lot of times, people take an assignment and they they do the opposite or they, you know. They, they, you know, turn it into a, um, you know, a poem instead of a, a story. That's, that, that, those are great. I, but that, that commentary that you just gave, um, is, does that exist anywhere? The commentary? Be, beyond what, what you just said, the story you just gave oh. about, around that assignment. Uh, like, no. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of us may have written about it. I mean, these students, they don't all keep their blogs, you know. The stuff disappears. Um, for most students, when they're done at the end of the course, they still kind of train to that mindset that my work is done. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't know how to say this without sounding a little cranky, but let me say, let me do it this way. So the six word, the six word, let me just do it. Um, the, the six word uh, memoir, right? That's got popular all over the place um, as an example, right? And I don't like it, right? So, because um, cause, cause it feels to me like, you know what? Uh, you know, Hemingway wrote an amazing story. And the heart of that thing is, you know, build something out of amazing stories, not do a six word memoir. And so I just worry a little bit about how things get popular. Um, you know, I had some dialogue with Christina around, uh, you know, um, you know, the uh, this I believe stuff. So I, so I'm just wondering if we can add to, and 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 there's nothing wrong with that, right? Of course, there's not. But it seems to me like it could be better um, if there was more commentary around the stuff and and some thoughtful pushing back. And is anybody want to respond to some of that? <laughs> I I I I mean, I'm jumping in all the time here, but I, I get you. And so a thing a thing that people may miss is that the thing that they produce, the media, is not what I'm looking for as a teacher. Um, right. um, so when my students write up their work, you know, and and I put the criteria in the chat, there's sort of a a three part thing that I'm looking for. So I want them to be talking about their idea and their process. So um, I want them to explain why did you choose that topic, you know, for your six-word memoir, and what's the inspiration? What does it connect to? So talk about the reason behind it. Th then I want to see your thing, and then I want you to talk about the process that you did for creating it. Um, so I'm not really grading people on their aesthetic. Um, I'm looking for that narrative uh, about their work, and before we even get to the creating, um, we go through some stuff, and we do the shape of stories. Um, uh, this uh, this last time around, I did a lot with the story spine, and that worked out really well. Um, so I constantly come back in my comments to their work. You know, um, that six word thing, it's great. All right, you put six words together and you put a picture to it. But is there a hook there? Is there is there something? Uh, you know, the thing that worked with with Hemingway's is it it it, it was um it was a misdirection. You didn't you didn't expect where it was going from the first word to the last. And and to me that it's the um. The thing uh, J.J. Abrams has this thing called the mystery box, and that's what makes stories work. So you know, uh, uh, those are the things I'm when I'm teaching that I'm kind of pushing on my students, not just create, 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 media, media, media. Um, I want you to do something um, that will surprise or um, go in an unexpected direction. Um, and and often these, you know, not everybody does that, and sometimes they don't work. But um, those are the things I want my students to get out of the class besides the media creativity skills. Mm -hmm. And Jack, Paul, you came just, uh, Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. You know, you're, you're being cranky. And uh, 
You know, um, in defense of those things, though, sometimes there's little magical things that happen with those real tight parameters, though, you know, like the six-word memoir um, and uh, whatever that other one you just said. What was the other one? This I Believe. Oh, This I Believe, yeah. Yeah, and it's been done so much that it's hard to break through, but every once in a while you get those little flashes of uh, magic. I don't do them too much, but, you know, it can happen. Yeah, I just want to stand up a little bit for theory and principle, you know, like uh, what, so what, it, and, and Alan said it better than I am saying it, that, you know, what, so, you know, what, what's, what's behind what you're doing, you know, be, you know, ask teachers to be thoughtful that way, I mean, and they are, but, you know, Chad? You, you, yeah, so, um, I wouldn't accuse myself of being overly thoughtful, but <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know, <laughs> there are, uh, you know, it's uh, take another brick out of the wall. I mean, how how often in in schools, uh, and sometimes in our lives, kids' lives, are really like asked, invited, offered the chance to do this kind of work, whether it's a six-word memoir or a poet, poem playlist or a sound story. Uh, how often are we given the chance to do that and to be kind of like encouraged to share process and to be assessed on how we participate in that rather than on like finishing something or making something perfect? Like for me, um, the theory and practice is opening learning spaces, opening different kinds of participation and using examples that are kind of well-known and easy to grok like that to get folks to start, you know, burrowing out of where they are towards uh, the open air of learning and information and creativity and community. Um, like in terms of uh, canonical or not canonical, like let's just say in terms of like a language arts pedagogy that wants you to communicate your ideas clearly and reasonably with the world, um, I, I, I think knowing that you could do that in a billion ways and have some agency over that is uh, just as needed a lesson, not that you can't get to it either way. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, that satisfies my theoretical requirement. Like, have you tried this before? No. Did you think you could do it before? No. Do you think you can do it now? Yes, and that, again, it's like one one less brick in the wall, and that's that's the real game because you know I like to see when people try the things that they don't know how to do or they say they're not good at. So most of my students, they come in, they come in already dreading audio. It's like, oh, I I can't wait to do you know uh, images and posters and gifs, but I'm really going to hate audio, and because they've never done anything creative with audio, and they don't realize that it's something that they copy and paste like, like text and that they layer. Um, and, and invariably, audio is one of the most um, highly rated sections that students come out with because they can use it in so many uh, different things. But, you know, you know, and that's some of the reasoning why we, we do our daily creates is because we want people to have these safe things that they can try on small and, and do things that they say that they're not good at. So mine is, I can't draw, and I say it over and over again. You know, when I draw things, they look like crappy stick figures. Um, but what I do is I try, you know, and so I'm learning um, to do things and do them badly, and then the next time I may have an insight. So um, we, we just want people to, to do a lot of things that they've never done before. Wow, look at those rays coming in. No, that's cool. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Can I do uh, that? No, yeah, go ahead, Terry. I um, I hate to bring in dead white British philosophers, but I'm going to. Um, Alfred Whitehead, his um, his, his philosophical theories. He's had he had these two ideas of romance and precision, and you can't get to precision without going through romance. And what I think he means by that is you can't get to um, finished products without going through play first. And if you look at any writer's notebook, mm -hmm. you'll see that most of what they're doing almost all the time is play. You know, they're not kidding when they say you got to write a million words of crap in order to get to that, that good stuff. 
which is not something we do very much in school. So, I mean, any time I can get kids to play towards something like you want, it's all to the better. That's the precision that we hope they reach when they graduate from college. But in reality, they're really not, most people don't reach it until well beyond that, mm -hmm. right? Through and, deliberate uh, practice and play. It reminds me of Peter Elbow stuff where it's like, you know, the things that I want to work on are the things that I like and I'm willing to put in the time to do it, you know. And so if we can yeah. get, if we as teachers can like our student stuff, see the potential in it, then, you know, the, the other stuff we do is so much easier. And it does seem like play, I think, at that point, you know, when we start to like these things that we're doing. And they can be really bad. I mean, yeah. need a lot of work. But um, I think that play and liking seems to be similar. Yeah. I, I want to invite Tommy in, Tommy Bateau. Um, in this way, Tommy, you, you um, I don't know, a couple of years ago started reading The Things That Carry? Is that, yes. Just as another example of this kind of thing. Um, and, and I think you were reading the whole book at first, is that right? We were, yeah. That was in a... Uh... Um, a class that was reading the things they carried, and then I was developing projects on youth voices to go along with it. Um, and um, the project that that uh, that we did for that one was they uh, the first chapter in the book is all about um, different items that people carry that are important to them and represent something and help them get through the war. And I asked the students to uh, write about something in their own lives that was important to them. And, uh, you know, I just opened it up. I let them work on it for a few days, and I had some different um, ways to kind of lead them in to think about not only concrete objects, but also, you know, philosophical objects and uh, different things like that. And uh, th the stuff that they got just from meandering and kind of exploring on their own was really amazing. They did some really neat writing um, and were very engaged with it. And it's that's part of my philosophy is if students are able to meander a little and explore on their own, um, uh, they, they just, you know, they find the things that are important to them and then they're much more into the writing process. And it's, it's funny, I've never thought of this, this whole kind of the way I'm viewing what you're talking about tonight is that it's even giving the students the chance to create the assignments, um, which is even more meandering. I don't know how my administration would go for that, but <laughs> I would love it. I think it would be, I think that would come up with really neat things, you know, mm -hmm. so frequently the students, you know, I think, oh, I've got this great idea, but then uh, when I let students play around with it, they come up with different takes on it that are so much more interesting and things that I never would have thought of. So I, th I think it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to allow that variability in, into the classroom, though, for um, you know people that are used to teaching in a real traditional way, it's it's kind of uh, I don't know hard to imagine that it'd work. But I think once once you kind of open up to it and try it, you really can see some unique things come out. And, and, and Tommy, it's it's not a complete. I mean, most of my weekly lessons, probably you know, sixty to seventy percent of it are the things that I want my students to do. Sure. You know, so it's, it's not everything is going to, to this open model. And, and the other approach I have is like, if you don't like any of my assignments, if a student doesn't like or thinks they can do it differently, I'm open to a different interpretation of it. So, you know, I don't really grade, I don't want to be grading them on whether they match my instructions. You know, if, yeah. they, can do, if they can do something interesting that meets the, you know, the goals of the assignment, um, I am all for that. So. You know, I encourage them to do the opposite, and, and I encourage them to, to um, even remix the, the assignment itself. I mean, I just wanted to, sorry, but you wanted to finish that story a little bit. This year, your students didn't read the whole novel, right? So. Yeah, this was a different class this year. This was my creative writing class, mm -hmm. and so I kind of did the same thing. We just read the first chapter in the book because the first chapter of the book is where each of the soldiers talks about the things that they're carrying um, you know a pack of playing cards or you know uh, one of them has a pebble that he carries in his mouth so we just read that chapter which really relates to the assignment and then I let the students go off of that and it worked well um, just that one chapter uh, worked well for that assignment so 
Yeah, those those pieces, like some of them, made me cry. Right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, there was one student. Yeah, writing about her father was really really powerful. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. Yeah. So, and just worth mentioning, um, it's relatively recent, but uh, back in November or so, we did open up um, missions on new voices, so students can jump in and create them. Um, so far, that's only been done in a workshop, but <laughs> worth. Well, so, Paul, yeah. I, was that, I, I was just thinking that I wanted to say that that. Um, your students or other students in these voices have created their own whole curriculums actually. I mean it's not like that is that unusual, but even building out of things that they've researched and then turning them into curriculum units, right? Yeah. I did another project this year where students uh, kind of created the thing that turned out well. Would you like to hear about that one? Quickly, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it was uh, during October, uh, during November for NaNoWriMo, that's the National Novel Writing Month. I had my creative writing class write a novel together. And uh, so what they did was each student wrote one chapter. So each student, each chapter was a unique voice, different perspective. Um, but they were all concerned with the same event. So I let the class choose the event and the class choose the location. Mm -hmm. And then they each chose a character and wrote one chapter. And it was amazing. The, uh, the, one of the classes in particular, the story came out really uh, beautiful, and the students really got into it, and they were helping to edit. So I, you know, I had ELA students and then also college-level uh, students and editing each other. And, um, and they kept working on it. Uh, even this semester, and now they've got it to the point where they're trying to uh, submit it to get it published. They're trying to find an agent for it. Um, so they really latched on to it. And it, it, again, it was just a, you know, I just let them go with it and kind of create the, the whole story out of it. So, so uh, you're inspiring me, and if you guys don't mind, I, I want to shift to how do we get teachers like Tommy, and let me ask you, Tommy, sure. were, you able to, were you able to share this um, assignment? sequence and so forth anywhere? Or? Uh, I haven't shared it anywhere. I'd, I'd be happy to. I, I thought it was really unique and I don't, I've never seen another teacher doing that with the NaNoWriMo project so um, I, you know, I'd be happy to write it up or anything like that. Yeah, so, so can, can those of you who are working on the island and <laughs> Karen speak up too, I mean, so how do we get the Tommies of the world to be contributing to these things because that's what will make them exciting, right? I, I mean, not that they're not already. But. <laughs> you do what you just did. You did a gentle ask, and <laughs> and, and I mean, I mean, you, people find these things out. I mean, I, I I do a lot of times. Like someone will say something, and I'm like, well, that would make a great DS one or six assignment, and and so um, yeah, part part of the role and. You know, I know, I know most people here know this in running these communities is, is kind of, you know, what I call the gentle nagging. Um, and, and so it's just, and, and really it's, it's inviting people in, um, you know, and sometimes they don't think, you know, that, that whole thing people go through like, oh, my stuff isn't worthy or no one's going to be interested. And so I, I don't know, there's no perfect answer that we can build as a system. Um, it's really this, this human uh, touch that we, we bring to it. Well, that's what I like about the um, WordPress Word uh, Make Bank that you made potentially, because I feel like, you know, DS106 probably has a certain context of assignment that makes sense in DS106 land, right? But then you could have another bank or a repository connected to say, oh, I don't know, digital is or something like that, or the MOOC or whatever, you know? And then you would maybe have another repository that would be more related to that work. Um, so it does seem like it offers possibilities um, for different banks related to different topic areas or focuses. And then how do all those speak to each other, I guess, is the ultimate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, you were at the conversation we had this summer where, where um, at the New York City Writing Project, where teachers talked about, okay, there are all these resources that's great, there are all these assignments, but how do I know which one will work where? And so I, and certainly Digital Wiz is one of those places, but, um, and Alan, I, I want to say, we, uh, on Youth Voices, we share the, or at least I do, the, and I think it would be good when people are making these banks to think about 
um, you can see the assignment, and then you can see examples right next to them, too. That feels like a really important part of the process. Um, so I don't know where to also go with that. Um, Karen, do you want to speak up a little bit? There were a couple questions in the chat room, but also even earlier, Alan said you and he were working on something. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> he's my, she's my beta tester, and I'm talking about talk it. Yeah, so what's up? <laughs> how crappy my coding so, is. <laughs> so, and I'll challenge you this way, Karen. There are a lot of uh, open educational resources, right? So how do we get people to use them? Right? Well, you ask that question all the time. Yeah, one of the conversations we're having in the chat room is about that the open piece of this really is important because it allows that reuse and remixing. And a, a mm -hmm. lot of times how I've gotten projects like this started is by taking other stuff that's open license and sort of starting to populate it. Because one thing I find with any of these banks is they pick up steam as they roll down the hill. Is that a mixed metaphor? <laughs> um, and people want to see stuff in there before they add stuff. So having some, and there's a lot of great stuff out there. It doesn't all have to be created. And having an open license, I think, is is really really important. And a lot of people build these banks, and I think they intend for them to be readily reusable, but they don't go to the step of the open license, which makes that challenging. Um, but I also think that the point Alan made about just asking people to contribute is really big. I think um, last year in the CL MOOC Make Bank, I, I'm I'm estimating, but more th I think about more than half of the entries came from either something we saw on G Plus or something we saw on Twitter or something we had a conversation with on our many Hangouts, where somebody said, "Oh, I did this thing." And just to follow up with somebody and go, could you put that in the make bank? And like just, you know, in any format, it can be rough, it doesn't matter. And we had a lot of people um, take that up, which was great. And I think, you know, back to the moderation thing, I do think moderating, I mean, I we moderate everything just because there's so much spam and just crap out there. But um, I have a we, pretty, uh, we, me, any project I work on, okay. I would advise moderation. <laughs> okay. Um, but I would say have a loose, you know, I, I'm pretty loose on anything that's remotely educational. Like if it's not spam, I approve it. And, and sometimes it's not exactly like what we were thinking about, but I think you can't underestimate people's ability to take something that you, you doesn't make sense to you or looks overly simplistic like we were talking about before, and sometimes people turn that into something really beautiful and amazing. So I think, I mean, to me, the whole idea of the bank is get a lot in there, and it's all about it's all about choice and sort of build building community around a big choice of things. And I, you know, I think on your point of teachers, you know, having to fish through all this stuff, and is it is it tenable? First of all, I would say it should be the learners who are making the choices more than the teachers. Um, but also, I just think you can't know what people are going to do. And I've seen so many times surprising and wonderful things come out that from yeah, me, yeah, who's yeah. usually in the box. <laughs> the, other, the, other side, the other side of the invite to add on to what Karen said, which is really appropriate to ask, is sometimes I'll see someone do something or I'll come across it, and I'll just put in the assignment bank and put their name on it. <laughs> and I'll ask them about it. You know, I'll let them know, but you know, I see these great things, and you know, it, it's right, an ex I, I, <laughs> I, can, I can do it quickly, and you know, they may not have thought of it, or, you know, I haven't had anybody say, like, oh, my God, you put my idea out, out there. Um, in fact, they're usually a appreciative. Um, so, you know, typically you'll find ones in DS106 that will be, like, you know, by way of or <laughs> from <Yeah>. Twitter. <laughs> I've done that also. I usually ask permission, but people are always happy if you're going to do the work for it. And then sometimes yeah. I'll come back and do a second one. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Especially when people build on it. I mean, I think that's, to me, this whole bank idea and what really separates it from, what separates the ones we're talking about from more just banks of anything is the user contribution piece. And what got me interested in this was trying to build community mostly with teachers and, and trying to build learner self-direction which I sometimes 
find harder with adults than with kids even but like how do you do that and so we tried all kinds of like you know hack the syllabus and come up with your own learning goals and I think for people who aren't comfortable with that 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 can be just really off-putting but something about the bank format it's like it's enough structure to seem somehow structured but it's but it moves people down the path of self-direction and it builds community because then everybody builds on what everybody does which is and it just seems to happen in a more natural way through this format than other things I've tried I've even used this kind of format in spaces outside of education of sort of you know forms driven user generated content it's pretty mm -hmm. powerful and it's pretty easy to implement mm -hmm. Yeah, and we did not invent it. I mean, it's been done over and over again. I mean, assignment banks have been around as long as there've been Manila folders, you know. Yeah, but there's something different going on around it too. I think, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's the yeah. framework for participation that's different, Paul. I think um, <clears throat> one is rises up from the experience of the community. Um, and the other. <laughs> drops down from like an elbow from the sky, you know, professional wrestling. Sometimes teaching is like elbow from the sky. And and I really All right. So Whitehead and professional wrestling. Go ahead. <laughs> we love Terry. <laughs> <laughs> right. More metaphors. I mean that's that's to me that's what worked with C L Moog is that was just this incredible upswell of uh, nuttiness sometimes. I mean, just uh, you know, it's even going. It's starting up. It's starting up again. Um, but it always seems to lead somewhere. It always seems to go somewhere, and it always seems to be tied in with the you know the general goal of the MOOC. I think people I think understand that. So, you know, you, if you make a framework for participation that allows people to crawl up, <laughs> as opposed to, to you know avoiding elbows from the sky. And I think you've got something good going for you. We're going to call that your last comment, and uh, if you don't mind, you can add more later. <laughs> and ask Tommy to say what he's thinking here at the end, if you don't mind, Tommy. Whenever you're ready, to jump in. Still yeah, I just had to okay. unmute there. Good. Uh, this stuff sounds great. I mean, I uh, I definitely. You know, it's a whole different way of looking at teaching um, than the traditional lecture-based. Uh, format and you know I just think that the more you can do to engage students and to get them uh, working on their own path and figuring out their own way of doing inquiry the the better you know the more benefit you're going to give to them so I, I definitely uh, want to check out the uh, what is it PS 106 I'm going to look more at that DS, webpage yeah. when I have some time. DS 106 yeah I'm going to check that out uh, Karen I love what Tommy just said and when yeah. he said it's a different approach to learning it made me think that maybe this is what flipped learning should have been <laughs> Christina I feel like I'm doing round 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 robin reading here, and uh, you know, you're all, everyone who's coming next is just thinking about what they're going to say instead of listening. But anyway, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, Christine. <laughs> what? Well, but we can't even hear you, Christina. Don't know what happened to your mic. Yeah. Well, uh -oh. work on that. We'll come back to you, Chris Sloan. Um, you know, as I wind down the school year, I'm thinking about next year already, and changing stuff and so it's kind of like um, you know how to work some of these things into an existing kind of culture that I have and there's a lot of room for play that's for sure um, so yeah I'm just beginning to explore the the DS 106 site and because um, I do a lot of media so it looks really promising to plug some of those things in but really it's the the trying to get into the mindset of sharing more uh, that's that's hard uh, just because well, you know like just doing the thing takes a lot of energy and then well there is a there is a move between doing something for your your kids and doing it for the world right right you know it's part yeah. like I have to build the workflow or something that, that I have to be better at that and can I add <laughs> since you and I work on youth forces so uh, um, 
um, Alan's point earlier that there's something kind of uh, important about other people doing the same thing at the same time. That's what we struggle with a lot on Youth Voices. Is it's a lot of parallel play, mm -hmm. and how to get how to get that connected. I think we should keep thinking about. Yeah. Chad, Christina, are you there? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay. Not yet. What happened? Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> sure. Um. So I'm still thinking a little bit about how to get folks involved in sharing what they do and in facilitating more learning like this. And um, you know, what's worked for for me over the years in several different communities is uh, encountering people with a clear idea of their organizational engagement ladder or contribution ladder. So, like, if you're starting out, they know kind of where where you might go next for help from them. Uh, if you are doing something really well, if you've mastered something, they have an idea or a suggestion about, hey, you could try any of these several things next. Uh, and coming up with a classroom like that uh, takes takes intentionality. Like, um, it's not just extension. It's what do I do at each level? Where when a when a kid has something that's beyond me, where do I help the kid ship that? So I think. Thinking about engagement and contribution ladders in our classrooms with make banks like this and, and taking what kids bring and produce from them and helping kids ship them out is important. Um, and then I'd also say one of the things that I'm thinking about now on the Mozilla side of things are teaching kits and how do you suggest a teaching progression that's not prescriptive, that is remixable, but that doesn't forget sometimes we need help seeing what participatory and playful facilitation looks like and how do we provide examples of that uh, around the make banks and and I think that can be a powerful curation tool uh, uh, you know, a guide to participatory and playful engagement with DS 106 or CL move from an educator standpoint more as a testimonial than any kind of prescription maybe. Cool. And Christina, we're we're gonna hear from you later, I think, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's like you suddenly lost your voice, but and so we're gonna end with Alan here. <laughs> I purposely didn't practice on anything, Paul. I, right. I've been listening Perfect. In, intently. Uh, All but, right. <laughs> but the, I mean it's the bank is it's a thing, you know, it's not a magic answer. And so, you know, you're gonna have to bring some idea or have some germ of an idea about how you might adapt, you know, what we use for one purpose um, to another, and um, you know, it's it, it could do great things, and it could kind of, you know, sit there. I've created plenty of um, similar banks over the the years um, that just never really took off in the way I, I thought they would. And um, sometimes you can do all the right things, and um, it doesn't go quite the right way. So it it matters a lot as to who shows up. Well, thank you for showing up here tonight. Um, <laughs> this feels productive. Um, and uh, when I say we do this every Wednesday, uh, we uh, broadcast here over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that uh, Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo set up uh, several years ago. Um, next week, believe it or not, we're going to try to talk about... Um, Connecting makers with teachers. Um, I was in a design competition up at uh, MIT, which I'll put out, and uh, for some reason they liked our idea, so we're going to kind of keep playing with that idea. Like, uh, like what would what would uh, 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 a connection site? And they exist, and we're finding people who have them. But uh, you're you're working on this project. Where's a maker in your neighborhood or nearby who could kind of come and help? So we're going to be thinking about that next week. So come on back, y'all. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks, right. Paul. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. <laughs>